During our long stay at Tarifa, few days passed on, which I was not employed either in opposing the French foraging parties or in carrying dispatches to and from Gibraltar. On one of these latter occasions, when returning to Tarifa after an absence of three days, detained by heavy rains, I was not a little surprised at finding a stream through the corkwood of Algeziras, much changed in its aspect. But three days previously I crossed it when the horse's hoofs were scarcely wetted. Now it had become a roaring and rapid torrent. The passage of this torrent was very dangerous. Its bed, with which I was well acquainted having crossed it fifty times, was formed of large smooth flags much inclined, making it somewhat perilous at any time to ride over it. Within fifteen or twenty yards of this, the only part passable, the watercourse suddenly wound round the base of an abrupt mountain, against which the torrent rushed with violence, and continuing its new direction, soon disgorged itself into the ocean. To make a false step in crossing was certain destruction. The current passed rapidly downwards between the mountains, its foaming surf interrupted in its course by huge and prominent rocks, with which the mountain sides were studded down to the very bed of the torrent, which now passing underneath, now boiling over the rugged and unseemly heads of those frightful masses of stone, gave them apparent animation. Like monstrous spirits of the flood, they seemed to threaten destruction to all who came within their reach. With such a picture before me, and considering it a stupid way of losing one's life, I hesitated for some moments, when the Spanish dragoon, who always accompanied me on such excursions, boldly took the lead and entered the hissing foam. His horse made some few slips, and more than once I expected to see both dashed to pieces, which must have taken place had the animal made a really false step. Fortunately, they got safe across, but this did not induce me to follow. Few perils I would not have encountered rather than ride through that frightful torrent, knowing as I did the nature of its bed. Yet to return to Algeciras I considered degrading, especially when the dragoon had so boldly passed it across. At length, and contrary to his advice, I determined to wade on foot and flog it forward my horse into the water, which he unwillingly took, and like the other narrowly escaped. The last trial was my own. I recollected that close above where the horses passed, a rock about two feet high stood in the centre of the stream, and to lean against that in case of necessity, I entered the water a little higher. Fortunately I thought of this precaution, for by the time I had with the greatest exertion got to where this rock was situated, I felt so spent and incapable of resisting the torrent that I could neither proceed nor retire. Placing both legs firmly against the rock, and feeling quite giddy from the glare and the rapidity with which the waters passed, I felt compelled to close my eyes for some moments. My situation was now neither wholesome nor pleasant. Boughs and trunks of trees rapidly passed at intervals down the stream, any one of which coming upon me must have either smashed me on the spot or dashed me headlong against the rocks below. But luckily I was preserved by another rock, which stood in the centre of the channel not far above me, rearing its ample head over the water. This, dividing the torrent, sent the floating batteries on either side. The poor Spaniard appeared desperate, violently striking his head, but he did not attempt the water a second time, nor could I blame him. I wore a very long sash with its still longer cords, such as light infantry bucks then used. Untying it and holding one end, I flung the other towards the Spaniard, who anxiously prepared to catch it, but it proved too short. He now took off his sash, which was also long as all Spanish sashes are, and rolling up a stone within it flung it towards me with such precision that I caught it with both hands. I now tied the two sashes together and fastened the stone within one end of the dragoon's sash, which I flung back to him. He caught it and gave a cheer. The only thing I now dreaded was that the Spaniard in his anxiety would give a sudden pull, which, with the heavy load of water I carried, 
might cause the silken bridge to snap or pull me off my legs, either of which things must be fatal. I therefore cautioned him to hold firm, but on no account to pull unless I should fall. He fully obeyed the directions, and I warped myself safely across. The faithful Spaniard hugged me to his breast, and having raped my cheeks of a kiss each, burst into a flood of tears, declaring that had anything happened to me he would instantly have deserted to the French. He said that, had I been drowned and of course carried into the ocean, no assertion of his could have prevented anyone from considering him the cause, and that consequently he would have been torn to pieces by the English soldiers at Tarifa. It was now about dusk, and the Spaniard having assisted me to mount, we started forward as fast as the badness of the road would permit, for we had several miles still to traverse. The expression of the inexpressible part of my dress at every stride of the horse resembled the sound made by stakes being fried in an adjoining room, while the door is continually shutting and opening. This simile will now no doubt be considered excessively vulgar, but at the period alluded to most officers were familiar with a frying pan, and even a guardsman in those days could rough it on a beefsteak and a bottle of old port. We arrived at Tarifa long after the officers had dined. Colonel Brown well recollects the circumstance, as it was on this occasion that I brought him a letter written by Lord Bathurst, appointing him Lieutenant Governor of Tarifa, with a pecuniary advantage attached, which was not the least acceptable part of the communication. In this expedition, I lost the use of a gold repeater, which was so gorged by the mountain torrent that I never afterwards could keep it in order. Soon after this, I was again sent to Gibraltar with dispatches, relative to which some notable occurrences took place. I should have previously mentioned that shortly after our occupation of Tarifa, a corps or civic guard, composed of young men, inhabitants of the town, was formed. The command of this body, called the Tarifa Volunteers, amounting to from 40 to 50 individuals, was confided to Captain Meacham, 28th Regiment, not only because he was a gallant and experienced officer, but also on account of his knowledge of the Spanish language, acquired at an earlier period when the regiment was stationed in Minorca. This corps in its infancy imperfectly drilled, without any established uniform and not very imposing in appearance owing to their diversity of dress, could not be relied on as an efficient force. For these reasons, perhaps it was that they got the name of Meacham's Blind Nuts, so baptised, if I mistake not, by Captain Allen of the 10th Regiment. However, to ascertain what might be expected from them, in case of an emergency which was daily expected, Major Brown determined to put their alertness at least to trial, confiding his plan to the Spanish Lieutenant Governor. After a jovial dinner party, he, about an hour before daybreak, ordered the drums and bugles to sound to arms and troops to line the walls immediately, stating that the French were rapidly advancing against the town. The first to be seen, sabre in hand, was the Spanish governor, previously warned. Then came forth the British garrison with firm and equal step, and last, and not too willingly, appeared the rather tardy volunteers. They were to be seen in small groups scattered through the town, no kind of formation having taken place preparatory to their going to the walls. And so they slowly moved along the streets. To hurry them up, a gun was fired, when an extraordinary scene was presented. Suddenly all the doors in the town flew open, and out rushed a fiercer and more warlike body by far. The streets were instantly crowded with women, one seizing a husband, another a son, a third a brother, some clinging to their dearly beloved all endeavouring to snatch them by force from out their warlike ranks, loudly and bitterly exclaiming against the British, who, they cried, or rather screamed, being fond of bloodshed themselves, would force others into fight, whether willing or otherwise. At length, urged by some British officers, and breaking away from their wives, mothers, sisters and lovers, in whose hands remained many cloaks, coats, hats and even torn locks of hair, 
the poor nuts arrived half-shelled upon the ramparts. Dawn soon after breaking, all the guns were fired off, but surpassed by the louder screaming inside the town. The rough music of the artillery was immediately succeeded by the more harmonious sounds of the band playing God Save the King. All was soon restored to tranquility, save for a few contentious blind nuts, each claiming to be the first who mounted the walls and offered himself to be cracked in defence of his country. Scarcely had this scene terminated when Colonel Brown received important intelligence of the enemy, and I was immediately sent with dispatches to Gibraltar by water, the wind being rather favourable though strong, but the weather rainy. On my arrival at Gibraltar, to my utter astonishment, I found the landing place crowded with inhabitants, officers and soldiers, all greedy to know the nature of my dispatches especially as I had come away in such boisterous weather and in an open boat. All were in the greatest anxiety, for an English man of war, happening to pass by Tarifa at the moment the guns were firing from the ramparts, reported the circumstance at Gibraltar, but as it was blowing hard at the time and there was no port, she had not been able to stop to ascertain the cause of the firing. This, since a second attack on Tarifa by a larger force was threatened by the enemy, caused the greatest excitement at Gibraltar. The first person who addressed me on landing was Lieutenant Taylor, 9th Regiment, afterwards shot through the body at Barossa, demanding without any prelude whatever if Captain Godwin of his regiment was wounded. I dryly answered, yes. Where? In the shoulder. Are they beaten off? They are not there now. This was sufficient to extricate me from the surrounding crowd, which otherwise would have impeded my progress to the convent for at least an hour. As soon as Taylor got his information, he, followed by the crowd whom I refused to answer, ran off to communicate his intelligence to his commanding officer, Colonel Mole, and Mole instantly galloped off with the news to General Bowes. In the meantime, I delivered my dispatches to General Campbell at the convent. Proceeding thence to Captain Power, who temporarily commanded the 28th Regiment, I was there met by Captain Loftus, aide-de-camp to General Bowes, with a message from the General that I should immediately, and in writing, state my reasons for having propagated unfounded reports of an attack and battle fought at Tarifa. I instantly answered that I had propagated no reports, that the words battle or Tarifa never escaped my lips that to get rid of an idle and troublesome multitude who surrounded me on landing, I muttered something in a low tone of voice to Lieutenant Taylor, telling him loud enough to be heard by many not to divulge anything, until the contents of the dispatches which I carried should be made known through the proper channel, that Taylor promised secrecy, and that my stratagem succeeded, for on his departure at a quick pace the crowd followed. I further added that, had I the slightest conception that anything thus communicated could be believed by a general officer, I should certainly have remained silent, however incommoded by the mob, and that to free myself from them was my only object. This explanation seemed to have been sufficient. I had no further communication from the general, but the circumstance having been privately communicated to General Campbell, he sent for Bowes and said, so, General, I understand that you have had a flying dispatch relative to a great battle being fought at Tarifa. I should think, General, that if such had been the case, this would have been the proper place for you to seek information, instead of sending in pursuit of the officer who carried dispatches to me to know his reasons for any heedless conversation that might have taken place between him and any idlers by whom he was surrounded at the mole. I understand also, General, that so pressing were you for his written explanation that time was not allowed him to change his wet clothes, for which purpose it was I allowed him to go away, since he had been drenched with rain for several hours in an open boat. I met General Bowes the same day at the General's table. With a smile upon his countenance, he very politely invited me to drink wine with him, and the Governor requested that, whenever I brought dispatches, 
I should make the best of my way through the idlers, but should communicate with no one until I saw him. Thus the affair terminated as far as the generals were concerned. But all my troubles were not as yet ended. I had to encounter others on my return. During my absence, Godwin had been told that I reported his having been wounded in the back of his shoulder. But although he taxed me with the report in a laughing way, still he appeared not well pleased. His usual good humour returned when I assured him that I never made use of such an expression, and certainly Godwin was one of the last to whom I should attribute a wound in the back. The fact was that he had been hurt in the shoulder a short time previously by his horse running with him against a tree. I frankly confess that while the affair was in agitation between the generals at Gibraltar, I felt somewhat nervous, owing to a circumstance which took place five years previously. It may be recollected that in 1805 the regiment were encamped at the Currug of Kildare. During the early part of this encampment, when I was on duty on the quarter guard, it so happened that General Campbell was general officer of the lines, and unfortunately it so fell out that the adjutant neglected to send me the parole and countersign until a very late hour. In the meantime came the grand rounds, who were rather hesitatingly challenged for the password, of which we ourselves were in total ignorance. The general, noticing the not very correct manner in which he was received and disregarding the challenge, rode up at once to the quarter guard, and, reprimanding me for the slovenly manner in which the advanced files were sent forward, demanded the countersign, adding that he believed I did not know it. At the moment, as the general turned his head away, the sergeant of the guard, having that instant received the parole and countersign, stepped forward and, whispering the words in my ear, put the paper containing them in my hand but the general perceiving some movement rode the sergeant for being unsteady under arms and called me forward rather briskly, repeating his belief that I had not the countersign. I told him I had. And what is the countersign? quickly demanded the general. I now coolly replied, I am placed here to receive, not to give the countersign. The general was evidently amazed at the reply and saying, very well, sir. We shall see about this in the morning, turned his horse round to ride off. This was the first quarter guard I had ever mounted, and from the novelty of the scene and my not having the countersign when the grand rounds arrived, I felt excessively nervous. But although my knees at the first onset beat the devil's tattoo against each other, yet having now gained full confidence, rather augmented by a titter amongst the general's staff, one of whom was his son. Afterwards, Sir Guy Campbell. I told the general that my orders were to allow no person to pass without his first giving the countersign. Here the titter increased. What? said he. Not let me pass. I made no reply, but retiring the two paces which the general had called me forward, I remained on the right of my guard, looking most respectfully at the general. After a moment's thought, he gave me the countersign, and having received the parole in exchange, rode away. I was in hopes that the unpleasant affair had ended here, but immediately after I was relieved from guard, I was sent for by Colonel Johnson, who, although not my immediate commanding officer, commanded both battalions as senior lieutenant colonel. To him, therefore, the general complained, and to him he seemed to attach most blame for allowing so young an officer and so totally ignorant of his duty to take charge of a quarter guard. All the field officers of the two battalions were summoned on the occasion to Colonel Johnson's tent, and in their presence the general recounted the whole transaction. I remained perfectly silent. On his coming towards a conclusion, when he mentioned my having refused to let him pass, which he repeated with emphasis, I saw a suppressed smile on the faces of both Colonel Johnson and Colonel Belson. But Major Brown, impatient of restraint, broke into a laugh, exclaiming, Well, he is only one year in the service. I am many, yet I wish I knew my duty as well. And, 
continued he with increased laughter. It is the first time I ever heard of a boy ensign taking his own general prisoner. Brown was wrong as to my rank, for I had been five days a lieutenant. However, the general did not seem to enjoy the joke as much as Brown did, and ordered Colonel Johnson to reprimand me. Johnson, who was brother-in-law to the general and one of the most gentlemanlike persons possible, bowed assent but in some way gave the general to understand that he was at a loss to understand what particular part of my conduct it was for which I was to be censured. The general having retired, Johnson's rebuke to me was very slight indeed, particularly when I mentioned, as I refrained from doing while the general was there, that the countersign and parole, with which I should have been furnished before sunset, were not sent to me until midnight just as the Grand Rounds advanced. But if the Lieutenant Governor recollected this anecdote when at Gibraltar, it certainly caused no difference in his courtesy or hospitality towards me. For he insisted that whenever I visited Gibraltar, I should always make the convent my headquarters. To relate the many and diverse occurrences which took place during our stay at Tarifa, although all more or less interesting, would swell these pages to an imprudent size. I shall therefore pass over many and come down to the month of January 1811. The Duke of Dalmatia, who directed the operations carried on against Cadiz and commanded the French force in Andalusia, was ordered by the Emperor to proceed into Estremadura, principally for the purpose of reducing the fortresses of Olivenza and Badajoz. Pursuant to these instructions, he marched from Seville in the first days of the month with an army of 16,000 men, having withdrawn a part of the troops from before Cadiz. The British troops stationed in this fortress were commanded by General Graham. This active officer, indignant at seeing the gallant troops under his command, ignobly and unnecessarily caged up in a fortress by an inferior force, counting each Spaniard who wore military uniform a soldier, and anxious to shake off the dead weight of his sluggish ally, General La Peña, who impeded the Spaniards under his command, both in working on the fortifications and fighting against the enemy, eagerly seized the opportunity offered by Salt's departure of bursting the trammels, which fettered British valour and striking a decisive blow against the enemy. To carry into full effect his well-digested plans, he proposed to the drowsy Spanish general La Peña and to the active British admiral Sir R. Keats, a sortie from the Isla de Leon, purposing to attack the whole French line, beat back the besiegers and bring the disgracefully pent-up Spanish and British troops into open air and active movement in the field. This bold and masterly project was eagerly embraced by Sir R. Keats and apparently so by La Peña, it was therefore agreed that whilst a bridge should be thrown across the river Santi Petri, a general attack should take place by the gunboats against the whole advanced French line from Ronda to Santa Maria. One obstacle, however, opposed. The bank opposite the Isla, upon which the proposed bridge was to rest, was with a strong force held by the enemy. To obviate this, it was determined that a diversion should be made on the outposts in rear of the French lines to call off his attention, whilst the bridge was laid down. In furtherance of this plan, General Graham requested General Campbell to allow Colonel Brown, who commanded at Tarifa, to move forward and attack Casa Vieja. Orders at the same time were sent by La Peña to the Spanish general, Beguinez, who commanded at Alcala de los Gazules to attack Medina Sidonia, distant from his post about 15 miles due west and directly leading to Chiclana. A despatch dated January 25th was late that night received at Tarifa by Colonel Brown, containing orders from General Campbell to move forward with all the troops he could take with him to attack Casa Vieja, and at the same time to favour as much as possible the movement against Medina Sidonia by the Spanish troops. Pursuant to his instructions, Brown, with 470 bayonets of the 28th Regiment and 30 artillerymen commanded by Lieutenant Mitchell, left Tarifa at three o'clock on the afternoon of the 26th and arrived at Fasinas, 
a distance of about 12 miles, at 8 o'clock. Here we halted for a few hours, and Captain Bowles of the regiment was detached with his company to watch the Vaja Road and prevent our return to Tarifa being cut off by any troops coming from that direction, since Vaya was in possession of the French. About 12 o'clock at night, we again moved forward, and at 7 in the morning we came in sight of Casavieja, a large convent with some outhouses strongly fortified and garrisoned by French troops, amounting to upwards of a hundred men and having two 24-pounders on top of the building. This building is situated 25 miles from Tarifa, in the direction of Chiclana and Medina Sidonia, with which places it forms a triangle. We now moved forward, crossing the river Barbate immersed to our middle, when we were warmly saluted from the blessed old house, as the Spaniards called it, which at the same time sent out from twenty to thirty sharpshooters. The regiment circled round to get in rear of the convent, while the light company driving in the sharpshooters took a more direct line and soon gained the crown of the hill immediately over the building. We now lay down, after descending to within pistol shot of the place, and opened so hot a fire that even a sparrow could not live on the walls. A parley was now sounded, and the garrison summoned to surrender, which the commandant without any hesitation resolutely refused to do. Colonel Brown thought of attacking the convent by storm, although he had no scaling ladders and the walls were very high, but reflected that even though we should succeed, which must be attended with severe loss from the great strength of the works lately constructed, its possession to us would be useless. He judged correctly that his instructions would be more effectually carried out by allowing the post to remain in the hands of the enemy and by continuing to threaten it so as to induce the French at Medina to detach a force to its aid. Since it was no part of our object to come upon the place by stealth, the commandant there had time in the morning previous to the investment to apprise the garrison at Medina of our approach and of his own danger, and consequently both infantry and cavalry were immediately sent to his succour. Leaving the light company to look down on the convent, and prevent all communication, Colonel Brown, with the rest of the regiment, marched towards Medina to favour any attack on that place. As he advanced, he encountered the detachment sent from Medina, whom he attacked and put to the rout. He then halted, giving his harassed men, who were soaked through with mud and rain and with wading rivers, an opportunity of refreshing and hoping also to induce the enemy at Medina to come forward. In both, he fully succeeded. We had already with us some mounted guerrillas, who were of more or less use, and during Colonel Brown's halt, he was fortunately joined by from thirty to forty Spanish cavalry, commanded by an officer, who gallantly did their duty as long as they remained with us. And it was a well-authenticated fact in those days that a small body of Spaniards attached to, or acting with a British force, when there were no Spanish generals with false pride to interfere, would proudly imitate the heroic conduct of their allies. The French force, who now advanced from Medina, were at least equal in infantry and far superior in cavalry to that commanded by Brown, who, his men now refreshed by their halt, retired steadily on Casa Vieja, followed by the enemy, whose numbers increased every moment, particularly in cavalry. The light company were now imperceptibly withdrawn from the high ground, which prevented those within the convent from seeing either our troops or those who were advancing to their aid. A few of the company, in very extended order and partly covered by the brushwood, were left, and these fired at any showing themselves on the walls, so that those in the fort were in total ignorance of what was passing so near them, and thus we dreaded no attack from our rear. The light company having joined the regiment and the Spanish dragoons closed in, Colonel Brown formed line, placing some cavalry on either flank. The main body of cavalry, together with the few baggage horses and those which carried our provisions, were judiciously posted on a gently rising ground immediately in rear of our centre, which gave an imposing appearance. On coming closer the enemy halted, 
no doubt awaiting still stronger reinforcements, or probably imagining that we did not show our entire force. As the dusk of evening advanced, Colonel Brown, covering his whole front with the Spanish cavalry, who commenced skirmishing with that of the enemy, and considering that he had a French garrison in his rear, a superior force in his front, and the ground favourable for cavalry in which the enemy exceeded him by far, silently retired in the dark, recrossed the barbate, and entered the gorge of the mountain pass, which being thickly planted with wood, secured us against an attack of horsemen. On this night, the Spaniards were to attack Medina, but reports coming in frequently during the night and down to a late hour on the morning of the 28th showed us that the enemy's troops, whom we had drawn on at such risk, had not retired, and therefore that Medina had not been attacked. Among the many messengers we sent out to collect information as to the movements of the Spaniards, one returned that forenoon, bringing a letter from the Spanish general stating that his troops were still in Alcala, but that he intended moving forward immediately. Thus all our hardships and risk counted for nothing. We felt much mortified, and would willingly have returned to Tarifa, from a scene where in appearance at least deceit had been used. But Brown, faithful to his instructions, moved out of his stronghold as soon as he learned that the enemy, whom we had drawn forward, had commenced a retrograde movement. Succeeding again in drawing them back, he again retired. The opposing cavalry were by this time much increased. On this day, we were joined by forty men of the Tarifa volunteers. Our situation was comfortless, neither houses, tents, nor huts to shelter us, and the rain falling heavily. It was the first time that Meacham's corps were ever washed clean, and the blind nuts began to see what was the varied life of a soldier. However, we kept up a blazing fire. Frequent reports during the night stated that the enemy were collecting in considerable numbers in our front with intent to attack us. But confiding in the vigilance of the Spanish cavalry, we felt no alarm. Between three and four o'clock on the morning of the 29th, our attention was suddenly called by the trampling of horses quickly approaching. Springing up from our seats round the fire, lying down was out of the question from the heavy rain. We were instantly under arms when an officer, two orderly dragoons and a couple of armed guides rode up, whom we immediately recognised as Spaniards. The officer was aide-de-camp to General Beguines, by whom he was sent to Colonel Brown to inform him that untoward circumstances prevented an earlier attack on Medina Sidonia, but that it was his decided intention to storm it next morning, and he requested the colonel to make every exertion in his power to aid the assault. From what had already passed, we felt very dubious as to Beguines's intentions. But there was something so noble and ingenuous in the deportment of the aide-de-camp, who solemnly pledged himself for the attack taking place, that for the first time we strongly suspected a Spanish general of sincerity. In this instance, we were not deceived. Colonel Brown told him that his support might be relied on, and instantly gave orders to prepare for march. The aide-de-camp, having sparingly partaken of our greatest luxuries, salt pork and rum, mounted his steed with all that grace so peculiar to a Spaniard, and he was as fine-looking and handsome a man as I ever met, and bidding us a cordial farewell commended us with religious fervency to God and St. Anthony, and so rode off over bad roads and through French vedettes to inform his general that the English troops were already under way. Groping our way in the dark, we advanced, and having crossed the barbate, were informed that the enemy were again retiring. Hurrying on to the convent, where we arrived at daybreak, we instantly opened a roaring fire of musketry against the building, more to make a noise than with the expectation of producing any other effect. Leaving the Tarifa volunteers with a few red soldiers interspersed, Colonel Brown with the regiment moved towards Medina. We had not proceeded far before we encountered a party of about sixty men, infantry and cavalry, who, upon hearing our fire at the convent, had turned round. They were instantly put to flight, pressing forward towards a mill about a league and a half from Medina, 
our cavalry and guerrillas, now exceeding sixty in number, were detached to the mill, as we knew it to be a post occupied by the enemy. On their approach, the enemy fled. When the mill, together with strong field works and extensive stabling recently finished, was set fire to, thus informing the enemy at Medina of our advance. Upon this, a formidable detachment was sent against us. Coming close, they halted for a short time, but soon displayed their boldness by a menacing advance, while we showed our judgment by steadily retiring, covered by our cavalry and the light company. As we fell back on Casa Vieja, firing was heard in the direction of Medina Sidonia. The enemy halted. We conformed. On both sides the cavalry skirmished by long shots. This petty warfare continued nearly two hours, when we retired gradually to our position over the convent. Here Colonel Brown received a dispatch from General Beguines informing him that he had taken Medina, but that the enemy were in strong force before him, and that he anxiously awaited the result of the sortie from the Isla de Leon. Soon after this dispatch had been received, the garrison in the convent were made acquainted with all that had happened in a very extraordinary manner. A large body of the enemy's cavalry bore directly for our position. So menacing was their aspect that our attention was entirely directed towards them, and Colonel Brown prepared to form square. In the meantime, a French officer, winding unperceived round the base of the high ground which overlooked the convent, had the boldness to approach it so near as to be enabled verbally to communicate with the garrison. The verge of the hill, as I have already stated, was lined by the Tarifa volunteers, who, not being accustomed to active warfare and being drenched by incessant rain, did not use that vigilance which such hostile close neighbours required. And it was the loud voice of the French officer which first called their attention. Many of them now fired, and some of the light company running up followed the example. But, the mischief being done, we all rejoiced to see that the gallant officer escaped unhurt. It was subsequently ascertained that the communication, thus heroically conveyed, directed the commandant on no account to surrender, for although Medina had fallen that morning, it would be attacked during the night, and the commandant strongly reinforced next morning. However, we conjectured at the moment, from the fact of the enemy having lost Medina, that the communication directed the commandant to seek an opportunity of escape with his garrison. The light company therefore resumed their old position over the convent, and the few guerrillas now with us were ordered to be excessively alert. The regular Spanish cavalry, with the greater part of the guerrillas, were skirmishing with the enemy in our front. From the time we left Tarifa, about three o'clock on the 26th, up to the same hour on the 29th, the weather was so rainy and boisterous as to frustrate all the plans of the British general commanding at Cadiz. In consequence of this, double dispatches were sent to Colonel Brown, one from Sir R. Keats, I could never learn why, the other from General Graham, stating that from the boisterous state of the weather, the intended movements and the sortie from the Isla were postponed, and therefore directing his return to Tarifa as soon as possible. The gunboat which carried these dispatches arrived at Tarifa only on the morning of the 29th. The naval officer in charge was strictly enjoined to give his dispatches into no other hands than those of Colonel Brown, or in his absence to a commissioned officer, who should be held responsible personally for their delivery to the colonel. There was no officer left in Tarifa, except Lieutenant Light of the Grenadiers, shortly afterwards shot through the body at Barossa, and he but just recovering from a severe fit of illness. He, though willing to undertake the duty, was incapable from weakness, and as the naval officer insisted on the absolute necessity of delivering the dispatches immediately, Assistant Surgeon Johnson, who had charge of the sick, volunteered to be the bearer and unhesitatingly set forth. Having arrived at a small hamlet about two miles short of Casa Vieja and rather out of his direct road, he had no guide and was never there before, he inquired where the British troops were when he was answered, 
at Casa Vieja, and they pointed to the convent. He rode directly to the gate and was instantly fired at from within. This took place at the very moment when, as I have mentioned, the light company were replaced immediately over the convent and the guerrillas ordered to maintain a vigilant lookout. As soon as the doctor was fired at by the French from within, he, as was natural, wheeled round and galloped away at full speed, but not knowing what direction to take, he unfortunately took the road to Veja, of which place in our present situation we felt particularly jealous. As the convent intervened, the doctor's approach from the hamlet had not been seen by us, but when we saw him gallop away from it at full speed, the light company would certainly have fired at him had he not been instantly covered by the mountain round which he rode. To protect himself from the inclemency of the weather, which continued wet and stormy, he wore a blue greatcoat, buttoned up to the chin, over which he carried a loose camlet cloak. His cocked hat was covered with oil skin, strapped also under his chin, and in all he showed no appearance of a British officer. In his flight he was unfortunately discovered by some of the guerrillas, who like us mistaking him for a French officer endeavouring to escape, rode at him with their lances. On such occasions, the lower end of the lance, which is formed of an iron slide or wedge, is driven into a box of the same metal fitted to receive it, and is always attached to the saddle. The horse, when an attack is made, is put to his full speed, thus adding his velocity to his strength, and with this full force Johnson was struck by a lancer under the elbow, breaking one of the bones of the forearm and striking him to an incredible distance from his horse. So far the act admitted of some shade of justification, but while the doctor lay on the ground, he received many wounds before it was found that he was a British officer. And before any of the regiment came up, the guerrillas had actually commenced sharing his garments. One took his hat, another his cloak, and so on. Johnson declared that on the advance of the guerrillas, whom he knew to be such, he pulled open his outer vestments to show his British uniform, while his assailants asserted that they themselves opened his surtout to take it away, and only then discovered the red coat by which his life was saved. However that might be, the act was cowardly, as they were told at the time, for eight or nine of these butchers attacked him at once with full intent to kill him. Their duty as soldiers was to take the doctor prisoner, supposing him to be a French officer, which I firmly believe they did at the onset, and to ascertain what information he possessed. But they then would have lost the spoil, being well aware that in our presence they would not have been permitted to rob a prisoner naked. On perusing the dispatches carried by the ill-fated doctor, who received all the attention and assistance possible and was immediately forwarded to Tarifa, Colonel Brown immediately saw the perilous situation in which we were placed. He was open to attack in front by an overwhelming force from Chiclana, where the failure of the sortie from Cadiz must have been known long before the information could have reached us and the object of our advanced movement consequently discovered. His return to Tarifa was liable to be anticipated by pushing a force through Veja, which, by moving along the coast road, would have a much shorter distance to get to Tarifa than we had, and that town, being left without any troops for its defence, except a few sick in hospital, must immediately surrender. Or again, should the enemy force Captain Bowles's company, detached to watch the Vajra road, they could come immediately in our rear and cut off our retreat over the mountain road which alone was left to us. Any one of these measures could easily have been carried into effect had the enemy been a little more lively. They had the intelligence of the failure of the sortie from Cadiz long before we had, and when General Graham's dispatch was received, we were then upwards of eight miles from Bowles, and therefore could give him no support were he attacked. Under these circumstances, Brown hesitated not a moment how to act, and instantly marched from the convent, exposed to its fire, the Spanish cavalry still remaining behind as a check on the garrison. During our march, Brown wrote to General Beguinas, 
informing him of his communication from Cadiz and demanding to know whether notwithstanding the failure of the sortie, he could maintain Medina Sidonia, at the same time candidly stating that he felt compelled to retire to prevent being cut off from Tarifa, but that, although the risk was great, yet he would at all hazard await the general's answer on the skirts of the wood. We remained during the night in the comfortless and slobbery gorge. The dispatch to Beguines was never answered, but next morning the colonel received a report from the cavalry officer left behind to awe the convent, that the French had again entered Medina the previous night at twelve o'clock, that Beguines was retiring to Alcala, and that he himself with the whole of his detachment had been recalled to cover the retrograde movement. This report was dated three o'clock on the morning of the 30th, but reached us only at ten o'clock. An hour's time would have been sufficient to bring it from where it was dated. Whether this delay of six hours was made designedly to keep us from retiring, which would prevent the troops in the convent from coming out, we could not say. However, it looked suspicious, and to us critically situated as we then were, might have proved fatal. Orders were immediately sent to Captain Bowles to retire along the mountains and meet us at Fasinus, while we retired direct to that place. Soon after Bowles joined, which was some time after our arrival at Fasinus, we all pushed forward for Tarifa, and about dark arrived at Torre la Peña. Here we came onto the plain of Tarifa, which in consequence of the late continued rains now presented a sheet of water extending to the town a distance of from three to four miles. Our way seemed a continuation of the ocean close on our right, the waters frequently intermixing. However, wade it we must. This operation to strangers would be attended with much danger from the numerous pits and deep ruts throughout, but as scarcely a day had passed during nine months upon which some of us had not ridden or walked from the town to the tower, we trusted to our recollection and pushed forward to Tarifa, where we safely arrived late at night without any serious accident. While we were wading through the waters, a lieutenant of the regiment was soused over head and ears, and when drawn out ejaculated, twixt joke and earnest, Ah, if my poor mother saw me now! This pathetic speech caused a general laugh, and whenever any similar accident befell, some mother sister or lover was called upon, which kept up the merriment until we arrived. A laughable or humorous expression coming from a fellow sufferer has more effect in rousing the energies and diverting the men from bending under fatigue than the most studied and eloquent harangue delivered by any who do not actually participate in their hardships. Were I to undertake a long and fatiguing march with a body of soldiers, I should prefer being accompanied by a man in the ranks who could and would occasionally sing a humorous or exhilarating song than by a Demosthenes or a Cicero travelling at his ease. Those who have accompanied soldiers in long and forced marches must have remarked how quickly and cheerfully the men fall into their proper places, timing their step to the cadence of the song and with what renovated vigour they press forward. In this expedition, as in all others which we made from Tarifa, too numerous to be mentioned, we were accompanied by Lieutenant Mitchell, Royal Artillery. In Tarifa, he was an artilleryman, pointing the guns from the bastion most exposed. In the field, he was a light bob, foremost in pricking for the foe, and on the occasion, just mentioned, he acted in a third capacity, for he reconnoitred the fort of Casavieja, guessed its capabilities from outward demonstration ascertained the strength of its defences by personal observation and formally reported thereon with all the inherent pomp and acquired gravity of a royal engineer. Although our little campaign lasted no more than five days, yet it was very severe from our having suffered much hardship and privation. We were sparingly fed, during the whole time drenched through by continual exposure to rain, without any sort of shelter whatever. Six times we crossed the Barbate River up to our middle. We approached no habitation save the blessed old house, its fire not wholesome. We had enough of marching over infamous roads, and we finally terminated our expedition 
on the evening of the fifth day by wading for the last three miles through a lake. Yet, as soon as we changed our dress and sat down to a smoking mess dinner, all our hardships were forgotten, and long before we retired to repose our thoughts and conversation, were occupied alone in speculations on our next enterprise. So lives a soldier. Our men were again ready for the field on the next day but one. Poor Meacham was sadly annoyed at being recommended to expose his nuts to the sun for at least a fortnight to save them from perishing by mildew.